Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our week 60th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsa. The Mahotsa is a 75 week long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking the celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, the People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in week 60 of the celebration with the Bharal or the Blue Sheep as the species in focus and the Himalayan Zoological Park Sikkim as the zoo in focus. So joined in today to speak to us on the species is Dr. Kulbushan Singh Suryavanshi, who is a scientist at the Nature Conservation Foundation, Mysore, and the director of the India program of the Snow Leopard Trust. Dr. Suryavanshi has been studying the snow leopard and its prey species, such as the Bharal, for the past 15 years. His team and him have also run, are also running several conservation projects with the local communities in the states of Himachal Pradesh and the Union Territory of Ladakh. He will speak to us today on the lessons learned from the Bharal about the Trans Himalayan region in India. So over to you. Thank you, Arundhati, for the wonderful introduction. Let me share my slides. Thank you very much, Arundhati, and thank you very much to the Central Zoo Authority for giving me this opportunity to speak about the Bharal, one of my very favorite species uh, of animals. Um, good evening to everyone who's watching. Uh, I thought while I have this opportunity to talk about the Bharal, I will also talk about what we've learned about its habitat in the Indian Trans Himalayan region uh, and, and what we've learned about its e ecological interactions with other species. So this is a, a Bharal. It at first glance, it's a very nondescript animal. It's it's got this gray slaty coat. Uh, the legs are black like a goat. The 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 chest is black. The horns are curved like a sheep. And very often it's also called a blue sheep. And I will come to why people call it the blue sheep. And I will also come to the point whether it's a sheep at all or not. This is a grown up adult male individual. And here is a young one. Uh, the young one doesn't look very different, but it's visibly very light and the horns are missing. Uh, females have very, very stubby, tiny horns, uh, just the size of their ears. And there is huge sexual size dimorphism in the species. What, what that means is that males are significantly larger than the females. Males can be as big as 55 to 60 kilos, whereas females are about 35 to 40 kilos. Where do they occur? And the habitat of the burrow is one of the most incredible places on this planet. They live in the high Himalayan mountains and the trans Himalayan mountains and the Tibetan plateau. So at average elevations of above 3000 meters above the, and which uh, all the areas are above the tree line. And you can get a sense of the habitat from the picture on the right. This habitat is also the lifeline of Asia in a way where the snow and glacier that this uh, area receives is the source of at least seven major rivers in Asia. And about a fourth of all humanity depends on the rivers that originate in the Bharal's habitat. And so if we think about its habitat, it is one of the most important habitats for survival of humanity in this region. Now imagine yourself at the foothills of the Himalaya in a, in a town like, um, let's say, um, uh, near Haridwar, when, from where you can look, look up toward the Himalaya and see the snow peak mountains in the distance and, and forest climbing up to it. The Bharal's habitat is beyond this. So if you climb up into these mountains, you will get to the high peaks and this is where it gets very rugged. There are no trees. It's very windy and it's very cold. If you cross this, you will enter what is called the Trans Himalaya. This is where the hills are rolling, but the elevation is very high. The plateau in front of you in the picture is at about 4,500 meters. And I've taken this picture from an elevation of about 5,000 meters. 
If you go further north, you reach, uh, sorry, this is a picture of the Spiti River. So the same landscape in winter feels even more harsh. It's very cold, very windy. And even though it looks like it's covered in snow, the snow is very, uh, very shallow. It's only a few inches deep. And if you go further north, you reach the Tibetan Plateau uh, or Changtang or Ladakh, and these are much more flat, open, wide areas, but at a very high elevation. And the Trans Himalaya, the rolling hills, and these areas are the Bharal's favorite uh, habitats. Here is a picture of the Bharal grazing next to this peak called uh, Chochokang Nilda in Spiti. And this is its ideal habitat where you have rolling hills with some grass and an ice covered high peaks surrounding it. Uh, this is where it, you, you have the highest densities of, of blue sheep anywhere in the country. In India, the species occurs across four states and one union territory. Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim and Arunachal are the four states where it occurs and Ladakh is the union territory where it occurs. This habitat is not only important ecologically, but it's also an important place culturally. Here is a picture of the key monastery in Spiti. And while we, we feel a strong connection uh, to this place spiritually, this is also ideal blue sheep habitat. And during my talk, I may go back and forth with using the word Bharal and blue sheep. I mean the same, they are, they are two different names for the same species. So back to the Bharal. The Bharal, which is often called the blue sheep, occurs is, is taxonomically placed in the family called Caprine. Caprine has all the sheep and the goat of the world. Now, does it matter that something is called a sheep or a goat? It does. Goats are actually animals which have short stubby legs and which use steep rugged terrain as escape terrain. Whereas sheep have long slender legs and they run over, over rolling hills to, to get away from their predators. Ecologically, that's a, those are two very different strategies and hence they are very important different groups. Now, typically goats have straight horns, whereas sheep have curved horns. And blue sheep is hence a, a big anomaly here. It has short stubby legs like a goat and curved horns like a sheep. And the famous biologist, Dr. Josh Scheller, went on a very famous expedition in, in Nepal to answer the question whether the barrel is a sheep or a goat. After three months of, of investigating its behavior, he concluded that it's a goat that looks like a sheep. And it is indeed a goat. If you look at those short stubby legs, and if you watch a barrel when it is being attacked by a snow leopard, you realize that they actually climb for escape. Here is a young Bharal again, uh, looking directly into the camera. And I mentioned that blue sheep is, uh, Bharal is often also called the blue sheep. And this picture gives you a sense that in the evening, if the light hits their gray slaty coat at a particular angle, they can appear blue to, uh, to the person watching. And, and I'm not surprised that the species is often named after its more romantic name, the blue sheep, than the bharal. Here is an urial. And here you can see what a, uh, what a true sheep looks like. And the curve of the horn is much more sheep-like than what we see in the blue sheep. And here is a, is a true goat, the Himalayan ibex, the straight horns that curve behind their back and not on the side, with its short stubby legs for climbing. The predominant predators of the blue sheep or the bharal are the Tibetan wolf and the snow leopard. And a lot of the species uh, characteristics are, have evolved to, out, out, uh, to escape these predators. So from here, I will talk a bit about the research that has been done on the species in the wild and learn and see what it has taught us about not only the barrel, but also its habitat. The, the barrel and the snow leopard are like the deer and the tiger of the Himalaya. They form a, a unique predator prey 
uh, ecosystems in uh, ecosystem in this landscape. However, this landscape is also occupied by people and their livestock, typically goat and sheep, the domestic goat and sheep. And the interplay between these four determine the ecology of this region and the conservation outcome in this region. So what are these interactions like? Some of the most important interactions are competition between livestock and, and the bharat. And our research tells us that livestock, because they are more numerous and because they have access to better resources, often outcompete the bharal in the field. Now, if the bharal is outcompeted, it was earlier theorized that snow leopards will therefore kill more livestock because they have fewer bharal to eat. And when that happens, people would get angry and capture snow leopards and often kill them. And this has been the dominant ecological narrative that we've, we've lived with for many years. However, with research, we've started to find that the narrative is slightly different. So here is me doing my master's thesis following Bharal in the icy cold mountains uh, uh, of the Himalaya in the Spiti Valley, where I followed them for six months, looking at competition between livestock and Bharal. And what we found was that indeed livestock does compete with the burrow and reduce its population. But then I went on to study how people think about them and what is the what is the interaction between snow leopard, livestock, and burrow. And here is where we found some surprising results. What we found is if there are more burrow, the traditional thought told us that if there is more bharal, then snow leopard will kill bharal and reduce its predation on livestock. But what we found that when there are more bharal, there is also more snow leopards and hence there is more livestock that gets killed. Now, I don't want to go into the detail, but I want to show how curiosity about nature can really, can really give us some surprising results. And, and here are some of the details of this study where you know, in the first graph on the X axis, we we have, you know, burrow density and as burrow density increased, we saw that snow leopard density also increased. Now, what that also tells us is if, if we want to have more charismatic species like the snow leopard, then we have to have more burrow that can support them. But studying the burrow in the mountains is not easy. Very often, this is not a priority species. But people like me who are really curious about the burrow often take the opportunity of studying them by studying other species. And here we had the opportunity to estimate the population of snow leopard all across the state of the of Himachal Pradesh. Now, this region has 30,000 square kilometers of high Himalayan mountains. And what we did was we placed 300 camera traps in this very rugged landscape to study snow leopards but we were also getting pictures of the bharal and we also went out and did surveys to estimate bharal population. And this study told us a lot, not only about the snow leopard, but even the bharal. One of the key results of this was the reiteration that if you want to have more snow leopards, you want to have more bharal because bharal, the population of burrow is the key determinant of population of charismatic species like snow leopards. And what you see in this big food web kind of a network is that the main determinants of all carnivore species in the Himalaya seem to be their prey and not necessarily the fear of a bigger carnivore. So again, the small, the short message is that if you want to have more carnivores, you need to have more herbivores. And this work was led by Janice Patel, one of our PhD students. We've also been monitoring burrow populations for the past 10, 12 years in the Spiti Valley of Himachal Pradesh. And what this study has shown us is very remarkable that when you don't have livestock, burrow population actually cycles on its own. What does it mean by cycling on its own? A few years, burrow population seems to grow up and then for a few years it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down. But it happens only when there is little or no livestock in the environment. It does not happen when there is a livestock, uh, a lot of livestock in the environment. And what this result means ecologically 
is that the barrel is a is a self uh, the is hazard mechanism called density dependence and its population is actually governed by its own density and not so much by the snow leopard and why is that important because it is important because it again reiterates the fact that to have more snow leopards we need to have more barrel and that bar to have more barrel we need to have better uh, postures and to summarize what what the barrel has taught us about this ecosystem is that livestock predation by carnivores like the snow leopards is not an outcome of reduced barrel density in fact barrel density if anything regulates snow leopard density but not predation by snow leopards the second big lesson that the barrel has taught us is that barrel conservation is critical for the conservation of carnivores like the snow leopard. And the third critical message is that to conserve the barrel, we need to maintain our pastures in the Himalaya at their, uh, at their top quality. With pasture degradation, we will have a reduction in snow uh, barrel populations and that will lead to reduction in snow leopard populations. But how do we go about actually conserving the barrel? And that can only happen if we work with the people who share their habitat, with uh, who share barrel habitat. And here is an example from Kibber village in Spiti Valley. This work is led by my colleague Deepshika Sharma, where she works with uh, women in different, uh, in different villages and creates conservation collectives with the women. She works with the women to create uh, handicrafts or other livelihood opportunities and the women in turn help her with the conservation of barrel. Now, one of the landmark projects in Hipper village has been what is called the village reserve. The village on its own has set aside land, uh, about 30 square kilometers of land for the conservation of barrel. This happened in the year 2002 when Dr. Charudat Mishra started this conservation program. Over the last 20 years, we have documented a six-fold rise in barrel population around this village. So what was very clear from our interaction in, in this village is that barrel conservation can, can really be achieved only by working with the people who live in this landscape. Today, I often see children of the village looking at the barrel like we see in this photograph. Neither are the barrel afraid of the children and nor do the children disturb the barrel. Through our learnings in, uh, on conservation projects like that, we are also working with people all around the Himalayas, especially in Himachal Pradesh, through this newsletter called Himkatha. This is a newsletter by the local people from the Bharal's habitat for the local people in the Bharal's habitat. In this newsletter, people write about stories, people write stories of their interactions with nature and create a local conversation about wildlife conservation. If you're interested to read more of this, you can go to the website himkatha.org. With that, I will conclude my presentation and leave some time for discussion. Thank you very much once again, Arundhati, and to Central Zoo Authority for this opportunity to talk about the barrel. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurbushan, for you know bringing out the information on how the barrel impacts the communities and how communities impact barrel in a in a very uh, time uh, bound manner. Uh, we will now move on to the second part of today's talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So, join in today to speak to us on the Himalayan Zoological Park is. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Sanjay Bhutia, who is the director of the Himalayan Zoological Park, Sikkim. So, Mr. Bhutia has worked as a divisional forest officer, Wildlife East Division, and as the field director of the Kanchenjunga National Park before joining at his as his, in his present posting as a director. He has also made significant contributions towards the national park, which is the Kanchenjunga National Park, achieving its status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And he will speak to us to us today more on the zoo. So, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Arundhati, and for the introduction. And first of all, uh, uh, presentation. Before the presentation, I would like to
before presentation. Yeah, I hope. Oh. Yes. And good evening to all. Hope uh, I'm clear. Yes, sir, you're clear. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all. Myself, I am Sanghi Gyatso Bhutia, and I am the present zoo director. Uh, present our administration in the zoo is uh, I'm headed by the director, uh, the DFO, the ACF, uh, the block officer, and the uh, zookeepers. So to introduce you to Himalayan Zoological Park, uh, first of all, I, I would like to introduce how Himalayan Zoological Park came into being. Uh, Himalayan Zoological Park, it's very different from other zoo because the inception of Himalayan Zoological Park, the idea of Himalayan Zoological Park was very different. It was envisaged very differently by the person who was the first uh, person who thought and envisaged the idea of Himalayan Zoological Park and he, he was late uh, Chichung La uh, He was the CCF uh, wildlife and he was very interested in wildlife and one of the um, great wildlife of our state. So you see, before the merger of India, Sikkim didn't have any zoo. So we had only a small area near the govern government secretariat, a small enclosures where we had spotted deer and bear. Uh, it was called a deer park. So the state thought of uh, having a zoo then after the merger, and then we could not come up with the zoo. Then the idea of zoo came up. So, but when the idea of zoo came up, the department didn't think about it as a zoo for recreation. It was um, thought as a conservation center. So it was designed as such. So when the zoo was first designed, you'll see that all the enclosures in our Himalayan Zoological Park, uh, if you come here, you'll see that the old enclosures are very big. It was never designed to please the uh, visitors, it was never designed for a visitor. It was basically designed for conservation, for the well-being of the animal. So if you see the enclosures, they are two hectares, three hectares. So enclosures are very large. So animals are basically in the semi-natural condition. So, but as you know, uh, as we progressed, then as we progressed, you know, to run a zoo, visitors are needed. Financial is, uh, important prospect in any development of any zoo. So slowly, now we are trying to balance that with the conservation. So we are trying to reduce some of the uh, visitors area so that the visitors can see the animals. Still, but we are uh, with the same theme and we have that in our, uh, what do you call, at the entrance also that you have to have patience to see animals in the Himalayan Zoological Park. So giving you a brief about how it was open to public, it was there, it was established, but it was never open to public, as I said. It was open to public only in 1997. As per the CZA classification, it's a very small zoo, but it has a very big area. To have 230 hectare area in a Himalayan area, it's a very big area, but as we have only 20% developed area, uh, it's, uh, governed by the forest department. Visions and objective, it's, I think, is basically, I will not go into that. Conservation and it's, it's uh, education research, it's same for everything. But uh, what uh, the, I would like to, um, current collection, we have a small collections of animals uh, right now presently. Uh, we have around 17 species and important as you said, we have blue sheep, red panda breeding. We are in uh, blue sheep, red panda, Himalayan thar uh, breeding programs. So we are uh, one of the high altitude uh, zoos uh, of India, and uh, we are under the uh, embarked by the CZA on the breeding program of red panda, blue sheep, and Himalayan thar. This, this uh, I, I told you already, as I mentioned already, it's uh, enclosures are based on exhibits concept of allowing visitors to share the landscape while keeping the animal 
so if you visit our zoo you will realize that um, you need time to visit our zoo it's not only animals that you see you need to get immersed with the landscape also there so now uh, as you know the zoo in you see the red portions these are the old enclosures now we are trying this is the master plan master plan which we have laid for the upgradation of zoo so uh, most of the area as you see on the left hand side is not covered only the middle portion of the zoo right now is 20 percent area is we, uh, we have only uh, concentrated we concentrated means only the enclosures are there now what we want to do is we want to have uh, the breeding center separately out of the uh, enclosure complex on the western boundary so that it doesn't interfere with any of the working on the zoo and the, and um, the breeding program is safely done in a separate area so it doesn't interfere with any of the working of the zoo so that is how we plan the zoo to spread it over with amenities and we have even planned for an ungulate safari or and a bird, bird open bird aviary this is the master plan which we have planned so as per the revised master plan as you know we have based on the taxonomy species wise uh, that is how we have planned, uh, uh, worked on the plan. And the uh, most important thing uh, of our zoo is that our area is very big. And this year uh, we encountered a uh, lot of predators. So one of the important lessons we learned is that we need to have a predator proof fencing. So that is one of the impo uh, imp important uh, lessons we have learned and that is what we are emphasizing on the zoo program and in the master layout and that's what it's uh, we have put it in the master layout also. Conservating efforts as you see in blue ship uh, we are the coordinating zoo, red panda we are the participating zoo, snow leopard we are participating zoo as you no know, but we don't have any breeding uh, unfortunately we don't have any uh, breeding pair, blood pheasant same thing we don't have any breeding pair, Himalayan tha uh, we are coordinating zoo and uh, we are doing good with uh, blue sheep panda and Himalayan tarp, which we are doing. Himalayan wolf, now again, it's the same story. We do, with the lack of uh, founder stock, uh, we don't have a, we are not uh, going on with the program. So this is a picture of uh, one of the panda breeding center. So most of our enclosures are big and uh, it's, we have kept it as natural as possible for, for the animals. So you can see, so uh, during, I have, we have observed that uh, breeding programs have been very successful and it's, uh, we have uh, got very excellent results, but there are some drawbacks which we need to work on and which we will be discussing later. This is again, uh, th these are not the topics to be shared as such. So again, this is any breeding program, animal uh, zookeepers relations has to be very good with the animal. So we ensure that that is done. Uh, uh, we give uh, time to time training and as well ensure that a, a, a particular zookeeper is kept for a particular animal for a long time so that he gets acquainted to his work. This is the daily, I think it's done in all the zoos. We also follow the same deworming, disinfectant, feeding house are cleaned every time, put, uh, for the potassium per max solution, sanitization. And uh, the other thing uh, which we follow in our zoo is that the food which we give to the animals are fresh. Even the meat, meat is supplied every day. We don't emphasis, we put emphasis on a fresh items to be given to the animals no refrigerated food is given to the animals even the meat which is meat is supplied every day to the zoo which is uh, inspected by the zoologist and the vet so that is how we go on with the feeding pattern and one of the important thing about our zoo is that we don't have a predator proof fencing as i told you earlier so uh, we had discussed with the CZ regarding this also we had a very big problem because of the canine distemper outbreak and uh, we are one of the zoos uh, uh, which 
was very much uh, affected by the canine distemper outbreak. And we lost uh, within a span of six, seven years, we lost around 15 to 16 pandas because of this canine distemper outbreak. And uh, because of this, we had a lot of uh, workshops done. Even the CZ had organized a workshop. We had uh, interaction with the um, the zoos and American uh, BOs officers regarding the um, uh, what do you call the vaccination regarding canine distempers. So, but as a remedial measure, what we are doing is uh, we have a vaccination drive. We keep that vaccination drive of livestock, especially uh, in and around the area. And uh, we have a uh, we have started even uh, canine distemper canine distemper vaccination for dogs in and around the areas. That's what we are doing presently. This is all simple things. Now, now as other zoos, now its scenario is very different in Sikkim. We are expected to do other activities than the zoo work. So as none of the wildlife sectors in Sikkim are well equipped for handling man-animal conflict, I, I, I don't mean to say handling, but in case tranquilizing. So all the tranquilizing till today, 99.9% .9 of tranquilizing of animals and rescuing from urban areas is done by zoo people. So this is one of the main uh, work which we do. We not only uh, cater to the welfare of the animals in the zoo, we also are very much involved with uh, tranquilizing of animal, tranquilizing and rescue of animals from urban areas, and especially Himalayan black bear, which we so recently this this year we have rescued uh you'll be surprised to know we have rescued more than 30 himalayan black bear so this is a very good example uh we received this himalayan black bear which was trapped in a snare so we had to tranquilize it and uh, there was an amputation uh, surgical procedure done in our own hospital and i'm thankful to cz because and JICA because we didn't have a very good hospital. With the support of uh, CZA and JICA especially, we were able to upgrade the hospitals and we have often where we could uh, do this procedure in our own hospital with the help of the our vet and as well as the help of the uh, local uh, department, veterinary department. So this is one of the success stories that we had this time. And you can see on, uh, in the picture, uh, we do regular tranquilizing exercises, trainings to field staff of territorial and wildlife. That is very important. And this year we had a very extensive, just before this uh, program, uh, two to three days back, we have a nine days tranquilizing exercise, how to, from tranquilizing to dart preparation to everything to be used in rescue operations. We trained around 20 to 30 people. So this is how our outreach programs other than the zoo management. So these are some rescues animal, hand raising of orphan animals. You can see Dr. Mindla who is here. She's one of the person who has been hand raising so many animals in our zoo. Now future prospect. Now we have a lot of future. It's a very big area. And I as a director, I feel that it has a lot of potential. Now, now as a potential, when I say, I don't relate the zoo as other zoo. So what I feel is if you want to develop your zoo and try to copy from other zoo, that won't happen. This zoo is very different from other zoo. My strength is very different from other zoo. So what I feel is here the strength doesn't lie in getting a lot of animals. Here the strength lies in getting animals. As you know, high altitude animals are very we have a very little population of high altitude animals. So getting high altitude animals, less animals, concentration on conservation breeding program, and try to capture the strength of this zoo. Now, the, the biggest strength of this zoo is that it has a very vast area, very vast area. So I said one of the things is that we can develop it as a Angulet safari, where you can develop with the angulets, we can keep, you can have a walk-in safari, not a vehicle, but a walk-in safari, 
and even the birds and the the boundary of the uh, what you call the zoo we have now started to develop eco trails so there are people who come to Gantok for a day trip of trails but and it's a very good place for bird watching that's one of the things and we have a very good view of uh, I don't have the pictures right now I'm sorry I couldn't show you the pictures I uh, I couldn't get you the picture I should have forgotten the pictures how you can see the whole mountain range from the uh, zoo area so to develop those areas we have been developing it now we are starting to develop it to capture that area to develop it as a trek route then developed it as a zoo as well as a trek route and as a conservation area rather than haphazardly developing and getting all animals building enclosures so i feel uh, we should develop it as a nature-based conservation area rather than a um, zoo with a lot of animals that's what i think how we should go about uh, in the Himalayan zoology path. Now, as coming to uh, blue sheep, what we have observed um, during our conservation breeding program, our uh, the breeding pair we got it uh, from the Patmani Nigeria Himalayan zoology with Darjeeling, and uh, since then we had uh, three birds in 2014, 15, and 16, and we have observed that breeding season is during usually during jan to february and gestation period is about five months and offsprings are usually they give birth during june and july and as suggested by dr kolgani as he had spoken up regarding the zoo uh, about the animal uh, we have observed that as he has stated that these animals are usually found in very high altitudes and the altitude of our zoo is around 3000 and basically it's not an arid area it's basically a mountain temperate forest so we observe some health complications because i don't know i am not the right person to but my observation regarding that is we observe some health issues because of that especially uh, bolting we have seen that in animals so but we see to it that uh, time to time the feed requirements are changed if some problems are there those things are done by our doctors day to day and uh, as uh, as uh, stated by uh, the previous speaker dr sir uh, i I have been in the wildlife sector. Uh, I was uh, I worked as a division forest officer in the wildlife east, uh, but I also worked in Kanjinjanga National Park for a very long period as a field director. And what I've seen, as very rightly said by him, and uh, I, I, I thank you for your very good elaborate uh, study on the observation on the uh, Baral, because uh, I also could see that observation myself when I was there in the field because I have my uh, 60, around 16, 17 years, mostly I'm also a very interested person who is very much involved in wildlife. Uh, and I have seen that I've never found in our area, I've never found a snow uh, burral below 14,000 feet. That, that is my observation. I've been to all the Himalayan treks, but I've never spotted an any animal below 14,000 here. So that is uh, one I've observed. And the thing, the second thing I've observed in the field is that I've seen in other animals, like uh, example, like Tha, Himalayan Tha, when it starts snowing, you see that animals usually come down to the lower parts. But in case of Bharal, I've seen that even during the snow period, you find the animals on much higher altitude rather than on the lower path. And uh, as pointed out by him in uh, Himachal and all uh, the uh, predator, as very rightly said by him, the, uh, the snow leopard population is guided by the Bharal population. And it was a very knowledgeable experience for me to know that other thing that in a in a scenario where there is only barral but no livestock present in that area, the animals kept 
keeps his population as he has mentioned it decreases and increases as per the uh, i don't know as per the uh, as per the animals uh, need so that scenario is very much uh, prevalent in sikkim because sikkim area the, the places where we find viral is uh, is very very far away from human habitat so those areas are usually four to five days trek from human habitat and those are the areas where we find morale and um, uh, we would like to as uh, as highlighted by him it's one of the main predator of blue sheep uh, i mean to say the snow leopard and it's very important for us to know the the uh, relation between the prey and predator if you want to uh, keep the population of the more majestic snow leopard. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhutai, Mr. Bhutai for sharing the uh, for sharing your views on the species in focus today, as well as on the zoo. So we move on to the question and answer session for today's talk. So uh, Dr. Suryavanshi, are you with us? We'll take questions for the species section first. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so the first question sir, for you is that are we aware of the of uh, the mating system that is followed by the by this uh, blue sheep? So yes, you know there are some very interesting studies on the mating behavior and mating systems of um, of the baral. And there's a landmark paper. It's called "Are There Alternate Mating Strategies in the Baral?" What it means is usually. So first I'll talk about mating and then, then I'll talk about mating systems. Uh, in autumn, uh, around uh, after after November, blue sheep gather in larger herds for mating. And there, you know, there are two or three different mating systems. In some places, it's the it's the strong dominant male who have who cordon these herds of female uh, to mate. Whereas the alternate mating strategy is some of the younger males keep harassing the older male and seek opportunities to mate. Now the young are are born typically at the end of the winter towards May and even early June. Uh, and so because the pregnancy of the female is during the harsh winter months, how the winter, how harsh the winter is, determines how many pregnant pregnancies survive and how many of those young are born healthy enough to survive the next year of their life. And so the, the strength of the winter or the harshness of the winter is extremely important when it comes to burial, um breeding and, and their population growth or declines. Um, and, and a lot of what I'm interested in, in doing in the field is actually to study how, you know, are there mechanisms through which Bharal can cope uh, with harsh winters? And it seems that uh, if they have grass species as opposed to browse species, you know, browse species are all the dicotyledons. But if, if there is more grass species, then it seems like uh, uh, female are able to have more young in the subsequent spring season as opposed to in areas where there is less grass species. Right, and the next question for you is that uh, in the wild, how is the long term monitoring of Bharal done? And uh, considering that the herd size is influenced by various factors, how exactly if, do we estimate population size in such cases? Uh, if you could just give it in a brief way. So there is a there's a method called the double observer survey. You know, group size doesn't matter when it comes to um, when it comes to estimating populations. A hundred burrow can live in ten groups of ten each, or one group of hundred each. The question is, can you reliably see or estimate all the groups that are there? And the double observer survey method gives you a statistical measure to arrive at that. And and there are elaborate papers and even online videos on on how to implement it. It has been implemented robustly, not just for the Bharat, but several other mountain ungulate species in the Himalayas, Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, China. Uh, so it's a very robust method for long-term monitoring, the double observer survey method. 
Right. So, uh, in line to that, the next question is that are there currently any population, currently or historically any population estimation of the species being done across its distribution range in India? So, there is an attempt, there's a project, an international project called PAUSE, which is Population Assessment of World Snow Leopard. However, one of the mandates of that project is to also estimate prey population. Now, we attempted it for the entire state of Himachal Pradesh. What happens is areas that you survey, you can estimate a population, but extrapolating it to larger areas is still a unresolved question. And which is where I was thinking, which is where I was saying that since there is very little attention directly for burrow, invariably you get opportunities to study burrow by opportunities of studying snow leopard and other species. I think this problem hasn't been addressed sufficiently. I doubt that. We will have a global estimate for burrow in the near future. What we will have is expert like myself giving an opinion. Uh, but that's that's I think that's the best that we're going to get for a while. All right. And uh, the last question for you uh, is that uh, do you think there's a need for transboundary initiatives for the conservation of the species? I mean, absolutely. You know, transboundary conservation initiatives have a very wide ranging impact, not just on conservation, on welfare of the people who live in those regions and welfare of the economies of the countries involved. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, however, transboundary conservation is easier said than done because, you know, especially around the blue sheep habitat, uh, most of the countries are very hostile towards each other. And having said that, I'm always hopeful that that, you know, we will uh, there's a lot of talk about transboundary conservation, especially in the Western Himalaya. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that someday we will have some good transboundary parks uh, for the conservation, not just of this species, but all the other mountain uh, mountain species. Right, and there's one more last question for you. It's that uh, how has the conservation, uh, sorry, how has the community, uh, community outreach activities that you've done within the range uh, helped in you know the conservation awareness and you know uh, from pro propagating the coexistence in the areas wherever it's happened. Is can you elaborate more on that? So see, outreach is about appreciation. You know, 15 years ago when we were working in this landscape, kids would look at these animals and say and would say, look at the heron or the deer, and so. The, the philosophy was you only conserve what you can appreciate. And Bharal, because our textbooks talk about the deer and the tiger, you know, we were so driven by the, the narrative of the jungle and the tiger and the deer that in this landscape, there was no focused attention and, and people didn't know the uniqueness of the wildlife that existed in their own backyards. And our campaigns were targeted towards that. Now that people know, there is a lot of curiosity in seeing and knowing how are these animals different from what they read in their textbooks or what they see on television. And once that curiosity is uh, uh, invoked that, oh, what we have here is something unique that not many people get to see or have, and that people may even want to come to see these things. I think that the conservation, uh, conservation sentiment really goes up. And that has been our experience both in Himachal and in Ladakh. Right. Uh, so those were the questions for you we had, and Thank we now move on to questions uh, for Mr. Bhutia. So, uh, uh, so the first question for you is that um, being in a reserve forest, uh, what are some of the free ranging species that can be seen when one visits the zoo? Uh, first of all, if you want to visit the zoo in the morning, you will find a lot of bird species. You can find around more than 100 bird species if you are a keen bird observer. And freelancing animals, we have spotted uh, Shero, uh, we have spotted a uh, leopard cat, uh, clouded leopard, uh, and then uh, you can see uh, barking deer, goral, pheasants. So basically, uh, this is why, why? because uh, the uh, Bulbule this is was a reserve forest first so it was converted to the zoo and it is continuity to the sanctuary reserve forest and that reserve forest is continuity to the uh 
Singbar Rhododendron Sanctuary. So we even find freelancing uh, near our, uh, we have a lot of rescued pandas from that area, uh, from inside our zoo. And we have even uh, witnessed a deer giving birth to a, um, a calf in our area. That's, we are fortunate for that. Right, sir. And the next question for you is that you, what is the flushing diet that is provided to the females in the gestation period that you have mentioned? I think you mentioned it during uh, this one of the slides. If you can elaborate what a flushing diet is. Yeah, that I think uh, more our uh, zoologists can highlight on that. Minla. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Hi. Yes. You are. Uh, uh, so, so the flushing that we are using right now is basically it's the same Caesar they prescribed that, but on top of that, we add about a 10 to 15 percent extra, uh, you know, feed as well. And uh, our veterinary section also provides a lot of uh, vitamin and multi uh, mineral supplements to the female. So that is basically the flushing diet. I mean, it sounds very elaborate, but uh, it's pretty simple actually. Uh, on that, uh, I would like to take a, uh, what an advice from Mr. Uh, Dr. Kulbushan. Uh, as he has mentioned there, we have been providing that as you as you mentioned yourself, these animals are usually found. I have observed myself. I've never seen this animal below 14,000 14, feet. Uh, myself, when I was, I've tried. So there, now as per the CZA uh, uh, guidelines, we have been providing some protein diets also, like uh, some grains, pulses and all. So, but this type of diet, pulses and all, are not, what type of protein do you think they get in the wild? Is it feasible for them to be provided with a protein diet in the captivity? Or what is the quantity of protein diet to be provided to them? Uh, to be provided to them. So uh, we had analyzed all the species that they eat in the wild, and we had actually analyzed them for crude protein. And crude protein in their diet is very low. Uh, the the interesting phenomena that happens with altitude is as you go up in altitude the nitrogen content of plants, the protein content of plants actually goes up, which is why, you know, nomadic herders actually move up in altitude, even though there is less grass, that grass has more, more protein. And hence, I think the guideline that if you are hosting these animals at a slightly lower altitude, then it will need to be supplemented with some protein. But how much exactly is a very difficult question for me to answer. One of the big changes that these animals go through in the wild is the summer and spring diet is almost five to six times more nutritious than the winter diet. And in the wild, they go through this very high seasonality in the protein content in the food that they have. In winter, it actually drops down close to 5%, which is the basic minimum. And then in, in summers, it's really, it goes up. Uh, and I don't know how one can modulate it in a in a in zoo conditions, um, but that's that's essentially. Um, I, I'm I'm not the best person to to talk about how pulses would help, uh, but it's true if if they if because the zoo is at three thousand meters, I I do see the the need for a slight supplementation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, and uh, moving to the next question for you, Mr. Vujia, is that uh, currently are there any research or outreach active conservation outreach activities that are carried out by the zoo? As such, research activities uh, we are coordinating with wildlife, uh, wildlife sectors, and uh, basically which are funded through the JICA. So uh, rather than in, uh, we have been uh, more in in situ conservation with the help of the zoo. Uh, we have, as uh, we have done a lot of uh, conservation activities from this this year, we had a program on what do you call, uh, we had an analysis on the population of the animal as stated by him, we had a snow leopard population estimate and because of that, we could analyze on the Bharat population also. 
so coordinately we have been doing and uh, our research uh, the, uh, department which is in the department has come out with a lot of good um, uh, research articles and a lot of research books and this is because of the help which has given through JICA so a lot of uh, conservation and research books is going on and as an outreach program as from the zoo what we try to do is uh, I feel that basically it's we try to tap in the younger generations. So basically, I feel that we are trying to tap in the younger generation, the schools. So we had outreach programs. Usually uh, we keep a lot of outreach programs in the zoo so as to uh, make them aware of all the conservation efforts that we are doing. All right, sir. So those were the questions for you. And with this, we come to the conclusion of our week 16 Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. Uh, and on behalf of CZD, I would like to thank Dr. Kulbushan Suryavanshi, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bhutia, and to Dr. Brenda for joining us for this talk and also to the audience for um, taking time for being there with us throughout this uh, throughout the session and learning more on the Himalayan Blue Sheep as well as the Himalayan Zoological Park. And I would also like to inform the audience that we would be back uh, next week on Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. with our week 61 species, which is the Goral and the zoo, which is the Dehradun Mini Zoo. So do tune in for that talk next week from 4 to 5 p.m. And for today, this is uh, this is the end of our uh, today's talk. So Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. So much. Thank you. Thank you.